All right, welcome to VP Culture's lesson on personality science number seven. We're getting to the end of our review of the five-factor model of each of these individual traits. And the last of the five-factor model of ocean is the end, neuroticism. Now, neuroticism is a word that we hear bantered about a lot and has some negative connotations. But it really is not meant to have a negative connotation. It just comes from the Greek word nevro, so it means your nerves are really sensitive. It means you feel other emotions powerfully, particularly negative emotions. And you think, well, that wouldn't be handy. It is actually a very powerful trait to have and a very powerful trait that you want to have within your organization for reasons that I'll explain shortly. But it's going to be a difficult trait for someone to maybe manage and to hold and to, to live with. So let's uh, delve into this a little bit more deeply. So it's gonna have two sub-traits of volatility and withdrawal. So one is an active response to danger. So neurotic people are going to be able to sense when danger can be within their world and they're going to either have a, a volatile response of actively trying to do something about it or they're going to withdraw and, and not engage with the system because it's dangerous. And you can see how this can actually be helpful for a team to have somebody on the team that has this sort of what we call spidey senses in the action adventure side to be able to ferret out what could be dangerous, what could be wrong with our world that we need to be paying attention to. So these people have very powerful traits that we need to pay attention to and have on our teams. So let's look at this in greater depth. So neuroticism withdraw. So how could this be handy? So if, if, something is just too dangerous, too difficult, there might be a time to just back away from it, not attack. So some people have this trait where they, this is their primary tendency, where they're gonna tend to move away from things. So let's look at how that affects their perceptions. They perceive danger pretty easily. So that's what they're looking for. It's like, whoa. And we'll look in the science section how their brain can forecast that more powerfully than most people's brains do. So they're looking for danger. Where, what could go wrong? Uh, what is possibly gonna cause pain for me and others around me? So what's the behaviors that they're going to exhibit most likely? So they take steps to avoid danger. They wanna move away from danger. So that sounds pretty smart, um, but they sense it easily and they move away from it as their primary behavior. So if somebody's got this in, in higher levels and they're pretty alert to themselves and their own personality and you and your team know this, there might be something where you encourage them to move towards something or when they're feeling the sense that they need to move away from something, maybe we should all move away from something. Maybe there's something that we should really take their counsel on as being something important. We'll see some, some people who do this and it leads to some really good results. So what about volatility? Well, maybe these are the type of people that see danger and, and, and lead us into action. Like, we need to change this. This needs to be done. We need to um, actively watch out for this or else we're going to get in trouble. We're, these are the people who might be preparing for danger when everybody else is going, no, nothing's going to go wrong. All the optimists and experts are thinking, no, this is fine. But they're going to be the people that can perceive danger and they're actively trying to change the situation so that it'll become better. So let's look at their perceptions first. So again, they're looking for trouble. They're looking for danger. Do they see it in their world? So they're constantly scanning and trying to make sure that there's no danger in their world. So see the situation from their eyes, both the, the volatile and the withdrawing person. Um, when you present a new project, when you present a new idea to your group, they're gonna go to what could go wrong with this? Oh, they're just a bunch of downers. They're always seeing the negative side of things. Well, use that as a strength. Don't criticize them. Bring out their strength. Ask them directly, what could go wrong with this? Feed into this as a strength, not as a weakness. They're gonna see things that you don't because they have perceptions. They have a brain that's highly tuned to that. And we'll see more about that in a little bit when we get into the science section. Okay, so let's talk about their behaviors. What's the primary thing they're looking to? How to stop the danger? This is what they're looking for. How do we make it stop? How do we take measures actively to get it to stop? So they're gonna suggest plans, they're gonna take charge, they're gonna move into things, and they're gonna to try to fix this behavior. 
Okay, so what are we looking at next? I look at the spectrum of superpowers from fictional and historical characters again to give you an idea of how you can fix people in your brain of to sort of understand this trait better of neuroticism. So our friend's character who is showing the most neuroticism is Chandler Bing. So he was always kind of, you know, he's that guy in the group who sees the potential difficulties first. Like whenever they suggest a plan of action, he's like, eh, it, it could go wrong. He's slow to commit. He's not, he's not rushing into relationships. He's not um, rushing into anything. He's always afraid of like, what could go wrong? What could go wrong with my career? What could do, what go wrong in our social relationships? He sees the potential issues and he's always kind of masking the pain with a little bit of sarcasm. So he doesn't always let you into his world. He's always got some sort of shields up a little bit. So, you know, very humorous, but his, his humor sometimes was used as, as, a, as a means to keep people kind of at a distance, as guessing what he was really feeling, because he felt a lot of darkness and uh, kind of heavier emotions within the group when it got into emotional scenes. So you can see that with Chandler being in the friends group. And then uh, our Star Wars fictional character, Princess Leia. So she's great at because she senses danger at time. And this is this is key why you could see like from this character why having someone with neuroticism would be great. Because at the beginning of like one of the early movies, she's like, okay, let's time to run away and find a planet where we can be safe because these Empire guys are gonna get us. So uh, the danger is sensed and she moves away from it. Withdraw. And then there's other times where she says, we have an opportunity to go and affect change by by going in and blowing up the death star so we're gonna we're gonna create this audacious plan to go in there and take this opportunity to seize the high ground and so because she's seen the danger she's going to take action and be volatile in the way that she uh and energetic in the way that she engages with the danger to try to change it so a leader who has this trait in higher amounts can both perceive danger and perceive opportunity and react appropriately within their sphere of this trait. Now, Winston Churchill is another likely leader who had high amounts of this trait, and um, he saw danger. So early on in, in World War II, before it started, uh, there was a lot of people in British politics were saying, oh, we should just make peace with this guy, this, this Hitler guy. Just make peace and things will be okay. Yeah, we'll be under their rule, but you know, how bad could it be? And he had, he had none of that because he, he knew and foresaw the danger of that particular situation coming down the pike. He was also somebody who first coined the term the, the Iron Curtain. You know, so he foresaw and knew the danger of, of communist Russia coming down the pike. And he warned the whole world in a great speech that happened in uh, Fulton, Missouri. You're not far from where I'm teaching right now. So he warned people about coming dangers and then he took action. There were times where he took action aggressively, like leading his whole country into war, arming them, not making peace, but making war. He declared war. He said, we will fight in the land. We will fight in the sea. And he inspired his entire nation to mobilize to that effect. And then he, there was times that he also ran away. You know, you think of the famous Dunkirk mobilization where he mobilized private boats and yachts and everyone to get these 300,000 men that were stranded on the beaches of France out of there. He didn't leave them there in danger and say, go and attack. He said, this is the time to withdraw into safety. And that move saved the British army and 300,000 men that were stranded there. So his taking action, his foreseeing of danger was, was a trait that made him a great leader, a great team player within all the other superpowers that he was uh, working with over time. So those are some people that we can think about. Now let's think about strengths and weaknesses of these, of these, you know, what I call a superpower, but also has some super weaknesses too. So they can sense danger. So that could be powerful. They can take action to stop danger or they can withdraw from dangerous situations that we've seen from some of these stories and some of these individuals. Now, what are some of the concomitant weaknesses that come with this? They struggle with the negative emotions. So this is a difficult trait to have. It's not fun to be neurotic. It's You're going to be more anxious. You're going to be a little bit more sad sometimes because you're feeling the difficulties of the world around you. Um, you can have unhealthy volatility. You can be kind of reactive and over if you can't, if you haven't learned to sort of deal with this trait within yourself well, um, you could have unhealthy volatility or unhealthy withdrawal where you're withdrawing from things too much. 
you're attacking things too much. So having this trait can be difficult. And but I've seen people and I've given you examples of people who do this really well and are very valuable assets to everyone around them. I'm low in this trait. And so I have come to appreciate having people around me who have this trait in higher levels is really healthy for me. They see things and they keep me out of danger when I went with my optimism would move into it, take too many risks. They move. They help me move away from that kind of thing. So let's talk a little bit about the science. Um, we're going to talk about the default mode network, which is kind of a, a network of different brain areas or prefrontal cortex and different interior areas of the brain. But, you know, when when they do those EEGs of the brain, they see that when we're not doing stuff, there's this default mode that keeps lighting up. And they see that these default modes tend to be towards the scanning for danger type of mode because it, it tends to be a mode that kind of reflects on our world, particularly our social world, and tries to find what could potentially go wrong. So you could see people who are high in neuroticism have this trait in, in a little bit higher quantities. Their brains are good at this. Now, what does this mean? This means that they're able to kind of create future projections well, and they're able to make future projections of other people's brains. We call this theory of mind, where they can kind of make an artificial brain of someone else, a picture of what someone else is thinking, what they're going to think. Charlie in marketing, he's probably not going to like this. You know, those people over there in finance, they're going to have troubles with this particular project that we're thinking about because they can futurize and picture other people's brains and situations very well, vividly. You can see how they can make prediction errors with this, but oftentimes they can make prediction that are correct. So um, these are the type of people that are on your team. And this is the neuroscience behind that. And again, I'm trying to show you that there's wiring behind this, that certain parts of their brains are stronger than yours. So with, like when your muscle is really strong at doing this, it might not be strong at doing the opposite motion. So utilize these people, release their awesomeness, encourage them and help them in holding their difficulties and holding this difficult trait. The amygdala, these are tiny little almond shape uh, brain nucleuses that are back in the lower part of the, the brain. And it's part of the limbic system and it's primarily responsible for fear and anxiety. So it kind of dovetails or works with the hippocampus and recording memories that are past dangers and alerting us to things that are similar to things in the past. So. It's another area where we kind of recreate past elements that were uh, difficult and that might be repeated and that could be dangerous. So you could see part of their brain is dictated towards future projection and part of their brain is dictated towards this didn't work in the past projection, which is the amygdala. So both of these combined and they both kind of lean towards fear and anxiety as the potential results. So you're actually intuiting the results of their brain calculations in difficult emotions. So that is why they carry difficult emotions. A lot of times they they have a propensity to have more negative emotions than, than the extroverts do. So not a lot of fun to hold, but if it's held well and with other people around them, with that serotonergic activity around them, they can use this safely and come up with really powerful interactions for you and your team to avoid danger and to move into potentially good scenarios that will work for you and for your team. So the questions, as we enter into this question session, do as we've done for all these other five traits of ocean. Um, have people stand in their high propensity or their low propensity or their medium propensity. And then while you're standing, answer these four questions and you'll see this entering interesting dialogue happen between you and your team as you go forward and answer these questions. And you guessed it, the question is, what advantages are there to having high amounts of neuroticism? So if you've got high amounts, what advantages are there? Let other people know. Maybe people who have lower have made some observations about how the people high in neuroticism uh, have brought good things to your team. Question number three, what advantages are there to having low amounts of neuroticism? What does it feel like for you to be low in neuroticism? Discuss that with your team. 
Question number four. What advantages are there to having middling amounts of neuroticism? If you're in the middle, what kind of perspective do you have between the people on your team and in your picture of the world? So those are our questions for you to discuss. And that brings us to the end of our personality science section on neuroticism. And neuroticism, of course, has two subtraits of volatility and withdrawal. That means they're either actively engaging in fixing the danger or moving away from the danger. Again, encourage people to release the awesomeness in this trait. Whether you have lots of it or you have little of it, you're an awesome individual who are going to play an important role on your team and to yourself in life. Use your traits to their fullest, embrace them, help them become even more effective in their interactions with others by understanding them. So that brings us to the end of lesson number seven. We've made it through the five personality traits. And now we're going to be talking about two other ways to look at this within our team and community context in order to understand how personalities fit into all of this bigger world that we call our workplace or our organization. And so thanks for joining us for lesson number seven. And we'll hope you'll join us next on lesson number eight.